So, <clears throat> yeah, this is the last thing I wanted to get to. There is zero chance, 0, 0.00 repeating that I'll give you a quiz over this. I just want to make sure we touch on this so that, because it was on my list of things to do and April happened, track meet season happened, all that stuff. So anyways, as long as we can say that we've kind of learned it, then we'll be okay. So um, do you guys notice anything about all of the questions up through question 18? Like that's a serious question. Do you notice anything about them? Or maybe more, maybe more to the point, do you see something that changes when you get to question 19? Thanks, Jared. Thanks, bud. Mm, that's not necessarily the distinction I'm trying to get you to make here. Very good. So well, I'm going to breeze through a couple examples on one through 18, but where this lesson gets a little bit trickier is where we, when we get to 19, good observation there. Notice that all the denominators on problems one through 18 match. And as you know, from back in the old grade school days, when someone asked you to add fractions together, that if the bottoms are the same, you just add the tops and keep the bottom the same. So one through 18 should be relatively simple. Um, there's going to be a little bit of factoring and canceling to do, but let's let's pop a few of these out. So like number one has us doing um, X minus four over something plus five X over the same something. How convenient. And so we already know going into this that our answer is going to have a three on the bottom, right? Because that's how fractions work when you add them together. Uh, what are we going to do about the top? It is. It is 6x because we want to combine like terms. Uh, minus 4 like that. And what you're going to want to teach yourself over the next couple days to watch out for is can I cancel things out? And so the only hint of hope that we have here is if we could factor the top. And you can actually factor the top. You can pull out a GCF. If you do pull out a GCF, what would it be? It would be a two, which I'm gonna go ahead and do it, but just to show you that it's not always something that you have to do because in this case, as you can see, it didn't do us any good. Where I would have gotten in trouble if I didn't do that would have been if I could have pulled out like a three or a six or a nine or something like that from the top, then that GCF, that factor in front, could have then reduced with the one in bottom. But as you've learned, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, these threes that I'm pointing to kind of with this directional arrow here, you know darn well that those are off limits, right? Because the three is part of three X minus two on top. So he's not allowed to play. So in a case like this, it would have been okay in hindsight to leave our answer like what's in the red box, but it wouldn't be harmful to go that extra step just to make sure that it's not factorable. Got it? Um, let's hop ahead and do something like, um, let's do like problem eight. And I know I'm skipping around and you'll do, you'll wind up getting a good lot of these done over the next few days, but um, I'm just gonna jump around and pick some at random. And as you have questions, then you can feel free just to you know ask them and I'll pop them up on the TV for everybody. So in problem eight, we still have the same denominators and we're just going to add the tops. So what's our answer going to be in problem eight? No need for, sorry, go ahead. Nice. So we have 12 over three times X, plus eight plus. You can. And so now what I see is there is an exposed factor that I can cancel. This is what I was talking about up above with these threes, kind of where that arrow is pointing. Those threes were off limits. 
the only things that would have been able to cancel would have been these things in this diagonal red box. But since they can't cancel, then that's why I had to stop. But in a case like this, this 12 and this three are both multiplications. And so I can divide them both by three. And that's going to cancel the 12 down to a four and the three down to a very pointless one, which then leaves the answer as four over no parentheses needed x plus eight. Because there's no point in putting one times something. That's just silly. All right, let's take a look at something like question number 17. And I know I'm, like I said, jumping around. I get it, but um, just trying to cover so we can get to the good stuff here. But what makes these nice is that, the, again, the bottoms are the same. So the, the stuff I'm really going to teach you here in about two or three minutes, it just doesn't apply because if the bottoms are the same, the hard part's already done. So problem 17 has us uh, subtracting. So we know the bottom of our answer is going to be um, x squared minus 9. The real question here is what's the top going to be? And I would caution you here to not overlook the minus that's in the middle. So what would it be? Yeah, well played. It is definitely x minus 3. And since I realized that there might be some silent questions out there, it's important that you see how that happened. It was 3x minus 8 minus, and then in parentheses, 2x minus 5. And I realize there are no parentheses in the problem, but they're implied by the fact that we're subtracting that entire top of the second fraction. So good catch there, Bryn. And so uh, we wind up with 3x minus 8 minus 2x plus 5. Again, excellent catch there. And then the 3x and the minus 2x make 1x, and the negative 8 plus 5 makes the negative 3. So that's how that top came to be. So would we stop here? No. And this is, I think, you know, you, you probably should be sort of familiar with this from what we've been doing for the last week. I, I know it looks like nothing can cancel out, but what can the bottom? Yes, the bottom is a difference of two squares. And so what I need to do, and you'll get used to this, is I need to make sure I factor everything if there's a shot of progress being made. So on the bottom, I'm going to factor it into x plus 3 times x minus 3. And then the top is still x minus 3. And we're not, I'm not contradicting myself here. I'm not cherry picking out the X and I'm not cherry picking out the minus three. What I'm doing is identifying that this entire top and this half of the bottom are both cancelable entities. And so these X minus threes are going to cancel out. What's my final answer going to be? Yeah, just like that. Does anything else in problems 1 through 18 catch your eye that you'd like to talk about before we get to the other stuff? Okay. So starting at problem 19 and basically for the whole rest of the worksheet now, your denominators are not going to be the same. And that's really what I wanted to make sure we got to before we parted ways here this week. Um, so if the bottoms aren't the same, think it probably goes without saying we need to make them the same right that's how you deal with fractions and so let's start with something simple like problem number 19. so we have 2 over 3 times x and we're going to add to it 4 over x the key the the big catchphrase for the week is going to be LCD, LCD, <clears throat> not GCF, but LCD. And LCD is the least common denominator. Some people get this quick. Some people, it takes a while. Yeah. Hopefully, even if you're one of the takes a while people, you'll get it before long. What is the least common denominator of these two fractions? That's a hard question. Nope. You're thinking of GCF if you say X. You're thinking of what do they have in common. And what I'm asking you for is, what is, let me ask you this. Let's say that we were doing, I'll write this in purple so you're clear. This is not the same. Let's say I had like M over 3 times 4 plus K 
over four. Forget the M's and the K's. I just didn't want to put numbers up there and make you think that that had something to do with this. If I gave you this as a, like your fifth grade teacher, I wouldn't have given it to you as three times four. I, of course, would have given it to you as 12, right? But a proper fourth or fifth grade lesson on this for you years ago should have looked something like this. Your teacher taught you, okay, class, we have to find the least common denominator of 12 and four. And what he or she probably taught you, I'm guessing, is that it helps to see the factors so that you can identify what you have to build. So you know this, by the way. What is the least common denominator of 12 and 4? The fact that you're still saying 4 tells me that maybe next year I should start with like a three-day lesson on fractions. It is 12, of course. The least common denominator is the denominator that you have to change both fractions into so that they can be added together. I can't add them together right now, but I can say, hey, fraction on the right, I can multiply your top and your bottom both by three to make you now have the same denominator as him. Let's practice that again. That was a little bit disturbing, but it's okay. It's been a, it's been a minute since maybe you've done that. So here we go. What if I gave you three fourths minus one fifth? What is the least common of four and five? It is 20. Good. What if I gave you five eighths minus one sixth? It is 24. Good. So is that coming back to you now? I'm not asking you for a common factor. If I was, I would ask you for one. I'm not. I'm asking you for a least common denominator. So going back to what I had said before I turned that 3 times 4 back into a 12, if I gave you the problem like this, What I need you to recognize about the least common denominator is that the, the least common denominator is a collection of all the parts you need to build any of the denominators. So when you see them out and exposed like this, you recognize that, okay, what do I need to build the yellow denominator? I need a three and I need a four, don't I? What do I need to build the green denominator? But I already have one, so I don't need to have the same one twice because he can essentially be used to build them both. I've used this analogy in the past, and you're welcome to, to give me a rating one to five stars because I never know if this makes sense to anyone other than myself. But in my mind, this always makes perfect sense. Imagine a denominator like a little Lego building and you have to build something. And what you have to do is you have to prepare a package of Legos that, let's say Dugan wants to build the yellow denominator. And then when he's done, he's going to put the Legos back in the baggie and he's going to hand it to Sienna. And Sienna has to build the second denominator. Think to yourself, what would I need to have in that baggie so that everyone can do what they need? So if Dugan were to look in the bag and he was going to build the three times four building, what would he need? Okay. Obviously, he'd need a three and a four, right? So his Legos would say three and four, and he'd put them together and say, I did it. And then he'd put his pieces back in the bag, and he would give it over to Sienna. And she'd say, well, thank you. I don't need this three, but I understand that it's in the baggie because you needed it for your building. So I'll just take the four out and I'm done. You have to think of a least common denominator as a collection of all the necessary pieces to build all of the denominators in the problem. Hence, in this case, the least common denominator being, well, 12. So let me ask you this, if that made any sense at all, let's go back to the problem that's written in white. If Dugan were to look in the little bag of Lego pieces and said, okay, I've been tasked with building this, what does Dugan need in the bag? He needs a three and an X, straight up. So Dugan takes out his three and his X and he builds his little structure. He puts the pieces back. 
and he hands it to Sienna, does she have what she needs to build her X? She does. So what is the least common denominator? It is 3X. The least common denominator is the smallest, most efficient packaging of pieces that you could make to allow all denominators to be constructed. Now, going way back in time when we learned about denominators, put your phone away, please. It's ridiculous. Take your phone. So now going way back in time, um, when we have to make denominators the same, which we do in this case, what do we have to do to the first fraction right here to make his denominator say 3x? Nothing. So we don't have to change that one. What do we have to do to the second fraction to make his denominator say 3x? Top and bottom both get multiplied by 3. Basically, you prioritize and say, what does the bottom need to be the LCD? And then whatever that is, you just do it and then do it the same to the top. You can do whatever you want as long as you do it to the top and the bottom equally. So my new math problem is now going to say 2 over 3x plus 12 over 3x. Simple modification, but now the bottoms are the same. And what is the answer? Done. And nothing can cancel, nothing can reduce. Okay. Let's take a look at something like question number 21. We have 3 over x for our first fraction. And we're going to add 6 over 7x squared. So again, we're talking teamwork here. So if I'm sitting there behind the scenes and I'm packaging up this little snack size Ziploc baggie of pieces, you can think of them as Legos or you can think of them as whatever you want, but you need pieces that will satisfy both parties. To make the first fraction, the ask is not very tall. The ask is just... Okay, stick an X in the back. So one thing right now is for sure. If I say least common denominator equals, I know it has to contain an X. Otherwise, the first denominator never gets built. But that clearly does not cover the second building. What's missing from that little baggie? If I just put a dumb X in there, what's missing to make the second denominator? I'm missing a seven and I'm missing another X. I need to make sure that when the second person opens the baggie and goes to make their building, that they have everything they need. And the second person very, very clearly needs a seven and an X and another X to make the X squared. So if I were to put these three pieces, X, seven, and another X in the baggie, I would have enough denominatorage to cover both fractions. So the least common denominator is 7x squared. Which, of course, then leads to the question of what does the first fraction need for his bottom to match the green oval? He needs a 7, and he needs another x. And if you give it to the bottom, you got to give it to the top. What does the second fraction need to match the green oval? So we leave him alone. And that's not going to be consistently the case. It's just the case on these warm-up problems is that generally you only have to modify one of the fractions to match the other. Soon here, the denominator isn't going to be the same. The, the least common isn't going to be the same as either of them. It will have to change them both. So for now, if I perform these red and white operations over here, this first fraction becomes 21x over 7x squared. The second fraction just stays as 6 over 7x squared. And what's the answer at this point? Right. And you should want to stop at this point, but you should also be wary of doing so because there is there is something we can do on top 
that turns out not to have a purpose, but it's still worth pausing and looking at. Tell me about the top. You can pull out a three. And it turns out really that it's a pointless endeavor because if you pull out the three, you're left with seven X plus two and nothing can cancel. I did not write this worksheet, this problem, these problems I found somewhere online literally like 10 years ago, but whoever wrote these kudos to them, because I think they keep setting traps for you. And that's not because it's not a mean thing. It's we do that to try to teach you how to avoid traps. And the trap in this case is obviously, look at how delicious those sevens look. But again, why can we not go there? Because it's part of the addition problem. The one on the seven that's with the X and the parentheses is like, don't, don't come near me. The only way I could go anywhere is if downstairs you can find me another entire factor named seven X plus two. Otherwise, I'm off limits. And then, of course, the three that we did pull out can't play nice with the seven that was in the box. Okay, making a little bit of sense. Got to make those bottoms the same. That's the key. All right, let's take a look at number 24. So my first fraction says 5 over xy. And my second fraction says 7 over 2x squared. And I... I it, years and years of trying to find the words to get young humans to understand the denominator idea. I came up with that stupid Lego thing. So again, if you got something better, roll with it. But I need a package of pieces. So if Brooklyn wanted to build this yellow denominator, she would say, okay, I'll get the ball rolling. To make my denominator, you need an X and you need a Y. Done. But if Brooklyn takes those two pieces and puts them back in the bag and hands it to Bryn, and Bryn says, I need to make this green denominator, what is Bryn missing? She's missing a two, and she's missing another X. It's, it's okay. Remember, Bryn doesn't need the Y, right? Bryn needs, Bryn's, you should be very selfish when you think about each denominator. Think about, I'm just looking out for number one here. And remember, we start the ball rolling by building the first denominator and get that out of the way. And then basically you ask yourself, what would I have to add into the package to make all the other denominators buildable as well? At this point in time, if I package up what I've written over here in red and green, it looks to me like my least common denominator is 2x squared y. And if I put that number or those pieces specifically into a little Ziploc baggie, that would be the most efficient way to allow each Brooklyn and Bryn to, in their own turns, make their own buildings. So once we understand what the least common denominator is, now it's just a matter of let's just build them. So what does the first fraction's bottom need to match the red oval? It needs a 2, and it needs another x. So we got to do it to the bottom, and we got to do it to the top. What does the second fraction's bottom need to match the red oval? It needs a y. So we'll multiply on the bottom and we'll multiply on the top. At this point in time, I have two, excuse me, I don't have two, I have 10 X over two X squared Y plus seven Y over two X squared Y. Mission accomplished, and now it's time to just blend. And you'll find yourself probably not showing this step as you start to get better at these. You'll just blend them as you go. So what does my top wind up be? Right, all over. And that's done. That's 100% done, right? And again, if you're even remotely tempted to like cancel the 10 and the 2, you just have not been listening for the last week. Um, you can't cherry pick pieces of addition and subtraction problems. Good. 
what do you notice about something like um say question 29 um one yeah, Sienna, good job. One of them's not a fraction, so we have to make it into a fraction. So the way question 29 starts is a whole number minus a fraction. So I, I start at least with this and say, okay, seven, I'm gonna at least take you and call you seven over one. Let's let's do that first. Okay, great. But the bottoms still don't match. So what denominator? do I need? You need x minus 9. And what's what's difficult for me is trying to convince people that x minus 9 is one entity. It's not two things. It's not an x and a 9. It's a packaged product called x minus 9. And so the least common denominator in this case is x minus 9. Since the first one doesn't even have a denominator, really, then it doesn't get to play. It doesn't have a voice in the LCD. So what would I have to multiply the first fraction by to make it match? How do I make this one, his bottom match what I need? Multiply by x minus 9. Whatever the denominator doesn't have, give it to it, and then equally give it to the top. So what is the new top of my left fraction going to be? So seven, can I just go ahead and do seven X minus 63? It's not gonna work that way um, because we have to blend the fraction. So I'll run through this with you. If I leave the top like this, uh, and then I of course put the minus four you do understand, of course, that those x minus 9s cannot cancel, right? Right, because it's part of a subtraction problem. Uh, so what's going to wind up happening is on top, I'm going to wind up with 7x minus 67 all over x minus 9. I realize you're starting to, to fade. Brady's looking for ways to allow himself to fall asleep. So I'm trying to get through this, Brady. If you'd write them down as we go, you might be less bored. Just a thought. I am crazy sometimes like that. So obviously we're done at that point in time, right? And you all understand in this problem over here why the purple arrow division is not possible, right? Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, let's hop ahead. We'll maybe do one more hop, maybe two more problems, and then I'm going to shut up and just let you start learning by working. That's probably the best way to do this. So um, let's pick something out of the stretch from... 30 through 35. Any of those look delicious to you? 32 it is. So we start with uh, x plus 2 over x minus 7 minus x squared plus 4x plus 13 all over x squared minus 4x minus 21. What are your instincts telling you we ought to do? 100% yes. You cannot see a least common denominator until you've got all the factors exposed. It was like that example I did 20 minutes ago with the number 12 on the bottom, how I factored it down to three times four so that a fourth grader could see that there were fours in both of them. That's what I want to do here is factor this bottom over here um, so that I can then expose the pieces that I need to build. What, I, what do I need to put in the little Ziploc baggie? So um, what does the purple oval factor down into? So if I replace this old denominator with the new and improved denominator version 2.0, now the conversation is less clunky. It's like, okay, what is the LCD? 
what does the first person's denominator need? What does the first person need to make theirs? They need an X minus seven. So if I put a piece in the bag and named it X minus seven and handed it to Matthew, he could take it out and he could say, look, I did it. Woo, I built the first denominator. Woo. And he puts it back in the bag and hands it over to Sadie. And Sadie looks in the bag and says, okay, you're asking me to build what's in this yellow box. What is she missing? So she also needs an X plus three. Bless you. If I put those two pieces in the bag, both people can accomplish their tasks. Which now leads us to the question of what does each fraction's bottom need? What is the first fraction's bottom missing? So I'm going to multiply by x plus 3. And I'm going to do it on the top and on the bottom because fair is fair. Notice I added some parentheses around the x plus 2 on top because that's just what you got to do now. You're about to go multiplying. You got to have that enclosed. What is your spidey sense telling you we should do next? It's a mess. I'd love to factor this upper right. Um, but you'll quickly figure out that you can't, right? That's one of those times where you're just like, well, that's weird. That's okay. So what I'm actually thinking we should do is we should take this purple box and let's multiply it back out because I want the top of one to be able to interact with the top of the other. I can't do that if one is factored out and one is not. And since I can't take the one that's not factored and factor it, well, I can always take two factors and multiply them like an eighth grader back together. So if I take the purple box and do that math problem, it says x squared plus 5x plus 6. Quite a substantial jump in difficulty from what we were doing 20 minutes ago. But that's why there's 50 practice problems on here, it's just to get you in that groove. So we're not done. There's potentially a lot left to do. The one thing I can say for sure is let's finish the job on top. So um, if I distribute this negative sign, then I wind up having minus x squared minus 4x and minus 13. You have to pay attention to those pesky minus. When there's a minus in the middle of a fraction problem, it pretty much spells doom for lazy people. Lazy people are like, I'm out. Because that minus winds up later on having to distribute himself through the whole top of the second fraction. And lazy people generally don't do that. So now that I've got all the parts and pieces out and exposed, uh, let's go ahead and simplify the top. How many x squareds will we have on top? None. They cancel. x squared and minus x squared are gone. They're out. Uh, how many x's will I have? And what is 6 minus 13? Good. So it's a good thing that we pressed on and proceeded with this problem because as it turns out, and this will always be the case. This is not going to be the kind of thing where if this doesn't happen, you necessarily did something wrong. But it feels nice when it does happen that you can now see that the x minus 7s cancel, leaving us with what as a final answer? Yeah, who'd have thunk that after all that it would come to this? OK. Let's pick one of the triples. So anything from 43 to 50 would be fine. And then I'll be done. I'm sorry that this has taken so long, but I'll, I'll stay out of your way generally starting after this. What, any of those look good to you? Forty-five or forty-six? Which one? Forty-five. Forty-five it is. 
So in 45, what's different now, obviously, is that we have three fractions. And so in 45, we start with 1 over x plus 1. And then we have a minus sign. Well, you know that's going to be trouble for some people. Don't let it be you. Minus x over x minus 2. And then a plus x squared plus 2 over um, x squared minus x minus 2. By this point in the lesson, I probably don't even need to ask, but what should we do first? Factor. There's one thing in here that's factorable, and as I said before, it's a denominator whose factors are going to allow us to spot the common well, uh, the common denominator. So what does that lower um, right, bottom far right factor into? And I do think that for some people, it helps to put, maybe not, maybe I'm just talking crazy, but denominators like this, I think it helps to package them. Something about forcefully packaging with parentheses that helps us to remember that it's not an X and a one, it's a package called X plus one. So having said that, what is the least common denominator? If I put x plus 1 and x minus 2 in a Ziploc baggie and I handed it to Dugan, could he build the first denominator? If he put his piece back in and then I handed it to Alyssa, could she build the second one? Yeah. And then finally, if she put her piece back and I gave it to Pablo, could he build the last one? Then we have a good common denominator. So let's go through the question of what does each fraction need, and then I'll be out of your way. What is the first fraction's bottom missing? So I'm going to multiply his bottom and his top by x minus 2. And I'm telling you right now, I don't like to gamble much, but if I had to, I would gamble that this is 100% where the mistakes would get made. What is the second fraction's bottom missing? Good. So I'm going to multiply his bottom by x plus 1 and also his top by x plus 1. And if, hopefully you've noticed, if I'm doing any good work here today, then you're going to give full massive respect to that minus sign that I just pointed to with a bunch of purple arrows. All right. All right, let's do this. Let's multiply across the top and see what we get. So let's begin with this green box. What is the answer to the green box? X minus two. X minus two. Now let's do this red box. Notice that in my red box, I've included that pesky negative. What's that going to be? It's going to be minus X squared minus X because that negative is he's got his fingers in all of those operations that come immediately after him, right? If you just do the top of the fraction, yes, it's x squared plus x, but that negative is like, you can't get away from me. I'm going to distribute to everybody, so just keep them coming. And what do we have to do to the third fraction? Nothing. So I can just copy down plus x squared plus 2. And I'm going to put all of this over the LCD, which is nice. Ooh, we made it. And the rest is just uh, uh, basic math. How many x squareds will be on top? None. Again, they cancel out. How many x's will I have? Mm -hmm. Holy smokes, none. And what will my constant be on top? Mm -hmm. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So the answer to this problem is 0. It's kind of crazy, right? When all that happens, when all the dust settles on this problem, you basically wound up with a top that equals zero. And of course, zero over anything just equals zero. So that's why overall we would just put zero. So yeah, didn't mean to take 35, 45 minutes of your class, but oh well. Um, you should now be able to do most of these. Um, you're going to have lots of questions. Make sure you ask them as you go, and I'll pop them up here on the board.
All right. So this is what you're doing the rest of the day today. It's what you're doing all day tomorrow. And it's what you're doing all day Wednesday. And this will be it. This will be your last mathy stuff for me for this school year. Got it. And I'm going to turn on the air conditioner because it is hot. It is hot in here. Hot like a hot tub. Are you burning up in here? No. Okay. All right. Pausing the recording. Just pausing.